Hey, um, welcome everybody and welcome everyone online. Um, I do feel a bit nervous about giving this talk. It is one of my favourite, favourite soapboxes. Uh, but I am very aware that I am in a university that people clamour to get into. And I'm saying it's OK to leave. So if I'm escorted by university, do you have proctors here? Oh, or something, some yeah, if I'm escorted by the university police later, please can bail me out from wherever <laughs> they take me. Um, so, I, like I said, this is one of my soap boxes, so I might get quite animated, but there is time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, try and sit on it um, for around 30-35 uh, minutes, and then we'll have some questions. And then there are snacks, <laughs> which is what I focus on as well. Okay, so there are a couple of elephants in the room that I would like to dispel. Firstly, I am from Cambridge. So it's very nice to be at the second best university in the world here today. Okay, the second thing is I'm a physicist, or I was a physicist. I don't know whether you can stop being a physicist, I think it's part of my core, uh, but I am quite a chatty one, and you know, that's good for that. Um, the other reason that I picked this, what is it? No. No. Don't worry, it's not all they're going to be a quiz, okay? It's a mammoth because when I was small, like little, little, I was passionate about all things scientific. I was a huge uh, David Attenborough fan. Luckily, I can still be a huge David Attenborough fan. Uh, but I absolutely loved anything about science. And age four, I announced my news pairings um, that I wanted to be a research scientist at Cambridge. I have no idea where that came from. Um, my mother was mystified. I then announced in the same sentence that I would like an electron microscope. <laughs> my mum, Julie, went to Debenhams to see if they sold such a thing. <laughs> now, in my defence, I grew up in the 70s where the only morning TV, so entertainment for a small child, was the Open University. So I'm assuming something sank in on that one. But I have wanted to be a research scientist since I was small. And thanks to my parents and some brilliant education, um, I then got my dream. But I'm getting behind myself, ahead of myself, I'm not quite sure. So I want to take you back to June 20, uh, what, 2000. Um, anyone was alive then? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I had to ask chat GPT what was happening. Um, then, because it is quite a while ago, and reassuringly, some things are staying the same. We still have a royal family, they've moved around slightly, but we have a royal family, we're still talking about that. Tony Blair was Prime Minister, and he popped up on the radio again this week, at uh, which point he got probably turned off. Um, Peter Sampras won Wimbledon, you might not have heard of him, but Venus Williams, we still hear plenty about. Uh, the UK government plans um, introduced the new living wage. Um, yeah, still going on that one. Uh, first, cancer patients received an artificial liver transplant and uh, died. That was um, technical progress, which we're still making. And we had a bank takeover. So, you know, something stayed the same. Why I'm taking you back to um, June 2000 is that. Um, in June 2000, I was a postdoc. I'd been a postdoc for three and a half years. Um, I was doing um, uh, in a clinical unit. Um, I was the uh, MR physicist, so I worked with MRI, um, looking at some really poorly patients. And um, I had done what was known in our lab as executed Plan Z. Anyone any idea what Plan Z might be? Have a guess. Oh, you're all very quiet. This has to change. Okay. Plan Z is having a baby. You don't know what to do next. So, Plan Z in our slightly odd lab was have a baby. So, I was out here pregnant with my firstborn. Um, this is relevant because um, when we went to celebrate. Uh, my friend Guy's Viva, so he, he did say, okay, so it is okay to say if you want to and you can be successful. Um, 
But um, he had just passed his fiver and we'd gone out for a meal. And because I was out here pregnant, I was stone cold sober. This is very important to remember for the next bit, okay? So we'd gone out for a meal to celebrate his fiver because I had mentored him through his PhD. Um, he was a year behind me, he'd been my um, undergrad student and we'd sort of come up together. And he said, and I still hold this against him, we'll just go to the pub for one. Okay, that would be yet another orange juice for me, okay. Parts, it was like, okay, really tired, just want to get home to bed, but we'll go to the pub for one. The Eagle, anyone know what the Eagle Stone is for? It's Cambridge Quiz. No? <laughs> DNA! Hooray! So this little blue pack, if you're here, sorry, I get told, hang on, mate. The blue pack on your screen. And um, mention Swatson and Crick. This is a rather key female figure off the pack, but she didn't go to the pub with them, so therefore <coughs> not on the blue pack. Um, so Watson and Crick. Uh, in theory, and now it's the discovery of DNA in the eel, uh, thus proving the cave is so much better. Okay, very lovely pub, uh, but it does have twisty stairs going down to the bathroom. I was out here pregnant, I'd been drinking orange juice all night. Predictably, I needed to go to the toilet. Don't worry, this will get less oversharing. <laughs> okay, so predictably, I need to go to the toilet, and I was thinking, right, well, okay. I have to go down the stairs. Um, to cut a very long story short, the next thing that I saw was someone like that. I had, I think, twisted my ankle on the stairs, not quite sure, it went around the corner. Um, everything else went around the corner apart from my ankle. Um, I got stretched out of a pump. I had been an undergraduate in Cambridge. I had done a PhD, which took way too long, in Cambridge. I'd never been stretched out of the pub until I was a cold sailor. There's probably a lesson there. Anyway, um, it turned out I broke my leg, broke my ankle, so I had a cast. So I was out here with a cast, and um, because I worked in the hospital, I went to the consultant, and the consultant was. Um, I said, oh, so I'll, I'll just go back to work, shall I? He went very slowly because I think he thought I was very stupid. You can't go back to work. I'm signing you off. And I'm like, oh. So I hadn't even started doing the transition from me leaving to go on maternity leave. This was six weeks out. So I had pretty much got six weeks to heal my leg until first one arrived. And so the consultant went, you're not going back to work. At which point I was like, okay, no handover, no nothing. Now, this was back in 2000. I had dial up internet. There was no Zoom. There was, thankfully, no Teams. <laughs> there was no, you know, sure, I could just about do email, and that was it. And I was sign of six, so I shouldn't have been working anyway. But various things, you know, kind of people needed to know which cupboard I'd hidden various things in. So, did get a few phone calls. Um, but it was like, oh, I stopped and I couldn't move. Since that crutches, you can't really do anything. You can't go out for a walk, um, especially when you're out here pregnant. So I was largely on the sofa. Also, bad things about the 2000, no Netflix. <laughs> okay, so basically stuck with daytime TV, which would die out with men, um, and nothing else. So. I had plenty of time to think and reflect. And this is my first lesson for you, is you need to build in time in your career, throughout your career, to stop and think. Now, I am quite a boingy person. I find this really hard to stop and think. I want to go and do something. Or I'll do some reflection, and then after five minutes, I'm like, oh, I need to go and do my to-do list now. So forced for me, but what I want you to do is think about when you stop and think. When did you last stop and think about your career? Have you been on autopilot to some extent thus far? So for me, I was good at physics at school. I was good enough to get into Cambridge, did a physics degree. Uh, turns out I wasn't going to be the next Stephen Hawking. Okay, didn't like that that much. So that was a bit of a shock. 
but then went pretty much into a PhD that was interdisciplinary that I loved. But they were, I had applied for other things at the end of my degree, but to some extent I was on that road. And I definitely became a postdoc in that mode. So it's a bit like a travelator. You know those things at airports that are flat escalators that you get on with your wee suitcase. And there's a break in the travelator where the gates are. But there's another one straight ahead. And quite often you just go and right, quickly walk over the gap and then get on the next travelator. The thing with the gaps is those are gates. You can go anywhere in the world in those gates. But no, you're going, oh, my gate's over there, so I'm going to get on the travelator. And I don't care that I could go to Bali or somewhere else beautiful. I'm on the travelator. And I think sometimes academic careers can be that. Because you are the brightest and the best at the second best university in the world. <laughs> well done. Um, so you can get that autopilot. So thinking about enforced reflection. Whilst I was sat largely on my sofa, um, this is the robot version of me. I was out here, it was very hot, no, it was a mess, so this is a much better picture. Um, I came to the conclusion that I wanted to stop being an academic, which kind of shocked me, because it was like, hang on, I spent all these years getting to here. But I realised that I wasn't really particularly happy in my job. The first bit of my postdoc I absolutely loved, um, but there were various things going on that made it politically quite um, interesting uh, in our unit. Um, I was in a small unit in a clinical setting, so there wasn't a career path obvious to me. I'd applied for a fellowship, I hadn't got that fellowship. Um, so various things combined to going, actually, I'm not enjoying this anymore. The thing that I wanted to be since I was tiny, tiny, I don't want to be anymore. So it came as a bit of a shock. But I then pretty much made the decision to stop being a postdoc. Um, and it was, like, it was a big enough decision for me. But another lesson for you is that I made a yes no decision. So, am I going to do it or am I not? Rather than I could do carry on being a postdoc, I could carry on being a postdoc part time, I could go and do this, I could go and do that, or I could stay at home with, um, as we later to have called it, Ben. So, I could do all those things. I had lots of options. You have an amazing number of options. You are highly literate highly numerate, problem solving, project managing, when that things, leaders, okay? You've, you've got so many skills, you've got skills coming out of your eyeballs. So you have options. It's not just uh, academia or not. It could be an academia and, or it could be academia for now, and then we can go parallel, we can go serious. So I made a yes no decision, but as it turned out, actually, oh, no, sorry, I should highlight the book. If you're thinking about making a decision, my favorite decision book is Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. Super readable. If a physicist is recommending a book, someone who chose a degree that didn't have much words, it's called the big one. Okay, so Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath, highly readable, quite entertaining, good at helping make decisions. Ooh. But actually, what I was starting was a squiggly career. Another great book uh, by Helen Topat and Sarah Ellis. Their website and their podcast is amazing. Strongly recommend that. And by squiggly, I mean that I started doing one thing, I then did something else, I then went off and did something else. I can stitch it together for you in a, in a talk to make it look like it makes sense. Um, some of it didn't really make sense at the time, but now it does. Um, or you might be running parallel tracks. You might decide to stay in academia, but work for a spin-up. Some of your PIs will be doing that. Um, you might do parallel tracks. You might have, 
you might be academic by day, barista by night. You know, kind of you could have, you know, that side hustle that then turns into something else. Our careers are no longer linear. My parents are in their 70s, until my 40s. Um, and they have pretty much the same career from age 18 to when my dad finally retired at 74. Like, come on, Dad, you've got to stop that. Um, but that's what they did for their whole lives. They are mystified by my brother and I. Uh, my brother at least works for a company, whereas I occasionally get, are you never going to get a proper job? <laughs> no. I've had my business for 14 years. I'm functionally unemployable now. But you can have a squiggly career. You don't have to do the linear thing. You could, and there have been events in Oxford on this recently, go out of academia and come back. It is possible to come back. Again, a myth that we're told. So I would embark you on a squiggly career. Your careers will be squiggly, whatever you decide to do. So I made the decision. It was then time to tell people. Um, and that was quite a tough one. Um, so I thought, right, I'll start with my friends and my family rather than my boss. I'll, I'll wait for a bit for that one. And um, so I told my mum. And my mum's been incredibly supportive um, throughout my career, even if she's mystified as to what I do now. And she was saying, she came back with, but you spent all that time getting here. At which point I was then back into, oh, I'm going to a What was my mum saying? And actually, that is an example of the sunk cost fallacy. So um, I think it was Richard Thaler first introduced this idea of, say we, were, we had, we bought tickets for a concert and we bought tickets for um, a band to be quite light and they've been, I don't know, 50 quid and picking them up here. So we bought tickets for those. Best mate then comes and says, and for me, which probably ages me, it's like, I've got two free tickets to go and see the Abba, Abba, Abba Tars in London. Would you like to come to that instead? If I was going with the sunk cost fantasy, and there is a tendency in all of us to do this, we go, well, I bought these tickets and they're 50 quid. So I hate to think how much it costs to go and see the other experience. Um, don't tell me, <laughs> disappoint me. But um, the te our tendency is to go for the things that we have either spent money on, and Richard Taylor was an economist, so that's what he talked about. Um, but then, and I'm just going to get their names right because I hate misquoting people. Um, then we had David Roy, Royan, uh, Daniel Sigro, and Anthony Tuckwell. Um, then did some research back in um, 2021, finding out that um, the sum cost fallacy is still applied to things like effort, belief, emotion, and time. So if we have put effort, emotion, belief and time into things, we will feel that tug of some fancy. It's not a logical thing. You're all very logical people. At least I hope you are. Um, so, you know, kind of we, we use the data today, looking at our data and thinking, right, okay, this is, you know, kind of, this makes sense. I'm going to make judgment calls on that. When it comes to our careers, we're driven by emotion, whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not. A good example of this, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but it's your CV. Too often I see CVs from researchers that have got, I might be over exaggerating, but they're cycling proficiency from preschool on there. You know, they've got everything on there. You know, you have to weigh their CV. They've got everything on there because, and when I challenge people, I worked really hard for that. I'm really proud of that. So I'm proud of it. If it's not relevant to the employer that you're going to, take it off. Hopefully that's career service policy as well. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, so thinking about that's a, one example that crops up. But when it comes to our careers, think about the time you have invested. Uh, quick show of hands. Everyone put your hand up in the air. You at home as well. 
You're a little bit odd in your kitchen, but don't worry about it. Okay, right. If you have spent less than five years in some form of formal education, put your hand down. If you have spent less than seven years in some sort of formal education, put your hand up. And also get out with you. Um, ten years. Get some hands down. Twelve years. Fifteen years. Seventeen years. Okay, just me. Um, <laughs> so we've spent up, oh, we've got a winner at the back. I won't ask how old you are. You obviously started at two, which is fine. Um, so we've spent a lot of time doing that. We have probably spent a lot of effort. You're all high achievers. You wouldn't be here unless you were. I bet you'll work your socks off. I bet you work your socks off in your current role. There is a lot of effort in there. There is also, I think, a lot of belief. Certainly for me, being a scientist was a vocation. Not in perhaps the sort of standard sense of, I don't know, joining the church or something like that. But for me, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to find out why things work in a very fundamental way. So we have belief in that. And I think we also have a lot of emotion. If you've, you know, it's that blood, sweat and tears thing, isn't it? That you, you've put that effort in to your career so far. So it's very natural and reassuringly human that we will feel this uncle's fallacy, this will hold us back. Reassuringly, the people who did the research said, once you realise that is the tug, it's quite easy to get over that hump. You just need facts and figures and information to combat that. You go, well, hang on, I might have seven years research experience, including my PhD, but that means I am absolutely brilliant at not only the techniques, but probably time management, written communication, oral communication, um, negotiation skills, all those sorts of things that are part and parcel of research life. You will have all those skills. So the sunk cost fallacy can stop us, but if we are aware of it, and we go, ah, oh, that's what's going on, then we can make that big leap forward. So my mum had a point. Um, thankfully, they hadn't paid quite so much for my education um, as um, some of our undergraduates coming out of uni now. But for, for me, it was like, that's great, but I've got lots of skills. I want to do something else. The other thing that I think um, surrounds us is myths. So there are a lot of myths in universities, especially in ancient places like this. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are particularly good at these myths, um, which mean that, oh, if you go and work in industry, you get told what to do. You're not allowed to think. I was told that. Um, or if you go and work for professional services in the university, you are turning to the dark side. Why could you not? My research supervisor said that. He kind of was okay about me giving up research, strangely, but moving into professional services was like, what are you doing? Um, and then sending my kids to the wrong rugby club really did know we're going to say that. Um, there are a lot of myths out there. And I work time and again with research, so they go, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure, uh, because this is a myth. And so my words to them are, do you think that, or do you know it? Okay, you are all very, very good, irrespective of discipline, at taking evidence and coming to some conclusions. You know how to find stuff out. That's what a researcher is. Your Google skills, other search engines are available, but let's face it, we don't use them, are brilliant. You can find stuff out. You don't have to sit there in ignorance. You can go and find stuff out. You can come here to find stuff out. Career services are brilliant and underused, in my opinion, by anyone other than undergraduates. Um, but you can go and find stuff out. 
you can go and talk to people. The trouble is, I think with researchers, is that if we go back to the myths, if we talk to the people around us, so our, we might have lovely principal investigators who are our bosses, might be really, really lovely, but if they've only ever been in academia and you ask them about life outside the goldfish bowl, they're not going to know. They know what the water's like and they know how to navigate the currents, if goldfish bowls have currents, it's a bad analogy, but you know what I mean. Um, they know how to do that, but they don't know how to um, perhaps tell you what it is like day to day in a patient attorney's job, in policy jobs, in working for Rolls Royce, wherever it might be. So thinking about who you ask, how do you ask them? Who do you know? Those people from your undergraduate years will have gone into all sorts of careers. And let's say fact, you probably went to the pub with them. So they're not that big and scary. You could perhaps go and ask them what it's like to be whatever, whatever, whatever. Chances are the careers you're thinking of, they've done. Um, so it's time, unfortunately, to get on meeting. Um, which always makes me think of Deadpool. Um, and if you've seen that film, you'll know why. Um, so do you think that, or do you know that? Really important to make sure that you are operating in the factual land. You're not being tugged by your emotions with the so-called policy, you're operating in the fact. So time for reflection, awareness of that sunk cost, knowing who to ask, so don't just go and ask the department, go slightly wider. Talk to people, find out. You could try internships, you could dip your toe in the water. You could try all sorts of things. You could just read about it. And um, there are lots of different ways of getting that information. Um, this was a suggestion from one of my friends and I really do hope it lands. Um, the university has a lot of expectations of you as researchers. And um, part of my tool of the Oxford University website, which I will, you know, link my search history later, <laughs> is um, I found this, which was Employment and Career Development of Research Staff. And these are some questions that during your contract, um, you, they suggest that, as it's Oxford, you, they don't tell. They suggest that you ask yourself. So things like, how is my work progressing? Have I asked for feedback from my supervisor? I'm going to object to that term if you're a postdoc, they are a principal investigator, from my colleagues. Um, what am I doing well? What can I improve? How am I working on these? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, thinking about um, you know, kind of what am I doing well? What can I improve? What are my goals um, down here? How do I see my future? be on the end of this contract. Now, personal reflection is great, but what are you reflecting on? So I'm going to turn things around just in the last couple of minutes. I'm going to give you time to answer them, but silently. Okay, I'm not asking for a show of hands or any feedback, uh, but if there are tears and I'm escorted from the, um, so please do come and bail me out. So what my friend suggested was, well, you could do a reverse appraisal. So these are like appraisal questions. And so my questions for you are, and for academia, read your research group, your discipline, um, Oxford University, uh, academia as a whole, whatever level you want to drill at. But just silently in your head, what is academia doing well for you? There are some people taking notes, so they must actually be good things. That's, that's reassuring. 
hopefully you're doing this at home and not having a sneaky cup of tea as well. Okay. Next question. Predictably. What could academia do better for you? What's missing? I'm not going to ask whether that's a longer list or a shorter list. Next one. What are academia's goals? And this is an important one to ask of any organisation because do their goals align with your values, what you want to be doing for a, a living? Um, so thinking about strengths, values. Strengths aren't just things that you're great at. You'll be great at lots of things. Strengths are things that make us feel strong. If we get up in the morning and for me, if I've got a day of spreadsheets, I'm good at spreadsheets. We've already had a nerd conversation about it, and I've got given a mug with spreadsheets on. Um, I'm good at them, but you know, by eleven o'clock, I am eating chocolate cake and drinking coffee like there is no tomorrow. You know, it drains me. Whereas if you give me a day where I have to come up with some daily ideas and turn them into a course, I'm still at it at six o'clock. You know, I've been away. I've forgotten about lunch. I'm really, really in flow. So thinking about not only those things that you're great at, but those things that you love doing. So thinking about goals of any organisation, are they aligned to your values? Do you know what your values are? Again, might be another point to note. And do they play to your strengths? And the last question, which if you are a PhD student, sorry, Oxford, DPhil student, um, then think about this at the end of your DPhil. If you are uh, a postdoc, lovely Diddy, you are my tribe, um, then um, uh, your contract. Like I said, I'm not going to ask for any answers, but reassuring me there's no one floods of tears. So that's good. Um, so reflection, find some time to think about it. If you're you're on a ticking time bomb, I imagine most of you either coming to the end of your DPhil or on um, some sort of postdoctoral contract, find time. You need to prioritise it. The only person who's going to prioritise your career is you. You might have fantastic partners, dogs, principal investigators um, who care about your career, but the only person who's going to prioritise it is you. Find some time. Thinking it's only Wednesday, so it's the rest of the week. When can you find time to sit and reflect? And don't just do an inner reflect five minutes and the back to it. Um, really think about it. Am I enjoying this? Am I getting a fair wage for what I do, bearing in mind all the other things that I get from being a researcher. 
if we're in it for the money, frankly, none of you would be sat here. So you must get other things. Um, so reflection, really important. Being aware of that sunk cost fallacy. Absolutely. If you feel that tug of, oh, I'm not sure, call it out. Name it. Get some facts. Be said over the head. Um, making sure that you're asking the right questions, that you're not operating from a myth standpoint, that you know the answers, that you found someone who does that job and you understand what that involves. Um, and to think about the answers to these questions. Where does that get you? And as a final thing, I'm actually going to finish on time. I didn't promise that to Chris. Um, is that I promise you a permission slip. So if you want one, you can go and find it. Now. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.